The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to legendary sports agent Lee Steinberg. He's the author of The Agent, My 40-Year Career Making Deals and Changing the Game. And he's just launched a new weekly radio show for Yahoo Sports. Stick around. You'll find Lee to be a refreshing, endearing character. I know he had me at hello. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media Interview, brought to you by Amazon.com, Audible.com, and 1-800-DIAL-DJs. Please stop by the website, MrMedia.com, click on our advertisers, support the show. And remember, there's more than a thousand interviews available at MrMedia.com. We've been doing this since February 2007. Hope you'll find something you like. And thanks for listening. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of fans who blame everything wrong with sports today on the agents instead of the real culprits, sports writers, in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. It's official. Every 20 years, I plan to interview sports agent Lee Steinberg. So go ahead, mark your calendars now for 2034. Our crack research team here at Mr. Media dug into the print morgue and found that it was 20 years ago that I last spoke with the man who inspired the Tom Cruise character in the movie Jerry Maguire. That was for a three-part article in Gallery Magazine titled Sports Agents, The Art of the Deal. Now, rather than quote myself on Steinberg, I think that's called journalistic incest, here is what Mike Ozanian of Forbes described how he described this man's career. At his peak in the 1990s, Lee Steinberg was the greatest sports agent in history. Not because he had the most prestigious roster in terms of star power, charisma, and philanthropy, but because he was light years ahead of his peers with respect to the melding of sports into the fabric of the entertainment industry. Not only did Steinberg consult for the movies Jerry Maguire and Any Given Sunday, but he also had his client, quarterback Drew Bledsoe, star in the former, hugely successful film. Steinberg also encouraged boxing great Oscar de la Hoya to promote his own fights, which the champion eventually did and, along with Richard Schaefer, turned Golden Boy Promotions into a powerhouse. And that's how he summed up Lee. Now, unfortunately, success and the pressure cooker of Hollywood can sometimes be too much for mortal men, and Steinberg fell into alcohol abuse and saw the reputation he built collapse under the weight of DUIRS and a Chapter 7 bankruptcy. But he finally had a moment of clarity while sleeping on a bed in his mother's house, chugging vodka nonstop, that that was not what his mission in life was supposed to be. That was the day Steinberg started turning his life around. Now, in recent years, Steinberg uh, has returned, uh, has reformed his original agency, Steinberg Sports and Entertainment, to represent athletes. Uh, he's once more raising his profile and has sought to regain his once extraordinary reputation as a dealmaker and business player. His latest deal puts the spotlight on a familiar subject, Lee Steinberg. The legendary super agent just signed a deal to host a weekly talk show for Yahoo Sports Radio. Starting August 18th, the Lee Steinberg Show will air every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Now, if you're in the central time zone, you're on your own. The math is just too complicated for me. Lee Steinberg, welcome to Mr. Media. Thank you. It's good to see you. Good to talk to you again. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping you're okay with my 20-year plan. We can come back here in 2034. <laughs> exactly, and uh, I think we can book 2054 also. <laughs> excellent, excellent. I like a good sport. That's perfect. Uh, I'm figuring by then maybe like a hollow viewer or maybe, you know, we could just, uh, you know, we could beam ourselves to one location or the other. We can do it in person or something like that. Or we'll meet in heaven. <laughs> oh, God. All right. You're optimistic. Maybe for me. Maybe, maybe that works for you. I, I, don't, know if, I don't know if I'm going to get there. Uh, 
Hey, <laughs> Lee, congratulations on the uh, Yahoo Sports uh, radio show. Uh, I know you've been doing a podcast, and I wondered how the uh, how the whole thing kind of came about and why you know why you want to do this. Well, I've done two talk radio shows in the past. One was on KCBS in San Francisco, and I did a monologue. I took calls and interviewed guests and spoke out on contemporary issues, gave fans a behind-the-scenes look at if the NCAA allows the top 65 schools to make their own rules as they did last week, what are the implications for college sports, if Ed O'Bannon goes ahead and wins his lawsuit, what does that mean for amateurism, uh, was the Ray Rice two-game suspension uh, appropriate, uh, Donald Sterling losing the Clippers, should Buffalo move to Toronto in the National Football League, and on and on and on. Is a $100 million contract really a contract? And then I did one in Los Angeles, Orange County, San Diego, and it's been an effective forum to allow fans to look behind uh, the scenes. And so Yahoo came to me and asked me to do it. Well, I'm writing for Forbes uh, Weekly and for Rant Sports. And so it's just another way to give fans a behind the scenes look at a little more of the context and a little more of what's really going on in, in sports headlines they see today. Well, I can certainly understand Yahoo's interest in you. Uh, you're a very visible guy. You've got opinions, obviously. You've got experiences that are really unparalleled. What uh, on the business side? What appeals to you about it? I'm sure it's not a it's it's not going to you know make you rich. What does it What does it do for for you know Steinberg's uh, sports and entertainment and for you personally? My dad raised me with two core values. One was to treasure relationships, especially family, and the second was to try to make a positive difference in the world and help people who can't help themselves. So speaking out, trying to make a difference talking about issues like concussion or the Sporting Green Alliance or bullying or domestic violence, um, trying to talk about athletes as role models are all things that I think are important. So really it's just a contribution back to the world. Okay. And in a, a radio industry that, I mean, includes, I mean, everyone, you've got the Jim, Jim Rome and uh, Jay Moore, there's ESPN Radio, uh, and of course, a million local sports personalities. Where, you know, where do you fit in in that spectrum? Well, I still do two or three uh, guesting appearances every day on other people's uh, talk radio shows, and I don't think that will land uh, by my doing a couple hours a week. I think that, in some ways, it's a unique perspective because for 40 years I've represented professional athletes. Not only that, our business has morphed. So we're now involved in marketing teams, leagues, conferences, any high profile individual and uh, corporations, and then content supply, sports theme, motion pictures, television, video games, any apps that can bring fans closer to sports that go across the multiple platforms working on a sporting green alliance to take sustainable technology to stadia arenas and practice fields working on issues like concussions so it's it's really experience in all of those areas um, if rip van winkle had gone to sleep back when i started in 1975 and woken up today he would have no idea what's going on with hundreds of television stations with social media with with this brave new world we're seeing in respect to what's uh, grown up in revenue streams around sports and what about in terms of style i mean you know guys like rome and Moore and uh, mike and mike any of those any you know pick anybody uh sports radio tends to be uh, a bit loud a bit emphatic uh, uh bombastic. Uh, but as I listen to uh, some of your stuff uh, from the podcast, for example, uh, I, I notice that you, uh, you and, and even here, I mean, you speak in slower, measured tones. I mean, part lawyer, part Southern gentleman, if you will. I mean, do, do you, uh, have you gotten any coaching for the Yahoo thing? Will you change that at all? Or are you just going to be you? 
Oh, I, I think they're going to put um, a heavy meth and, <laughs> and uh, a taser on me so uh -huh. I speak more rapidly and am much more exciting. Um, I think people can handle a conversational style and one-on-one -on -one interaction uh, that that isn't With the uh, bobby, bobby pins and bubble gum now. Bubblegum. There you are. There you are. Thanks, Diego. Thanks, Diego. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. So let's, let, let's we'll move on to the next question. Okay. All right. All right. Um, um, tell me about the, sh the the show as you imagine it. it will it be uh, will it be guests? Will it be uh, a call in? Uh, will it be you? You know, uh, pontificating. What what'll it be like? <laughs> oh. Enormous amounts of pontificating, because I know that's what listeners yearn for. Uh, I think we'll start with uh, whatever's hot and topical and, and talk that out and lay some topics on the table at the beginning of each show. I know that we'll have great guests. Uh, I think that I'll probably do Adam Schefter on the NFL uh, for the from two perspectives. One will be... How does someone get into sports writing? How do they get into sports television? So there's a massive interest. Those of us who grew up loving sports, and it became clear to us at some point that we were not going to be professional athletes. There's a massive interest in colleges, business law schools, everywhere. How do we get closer to sports? And that's where the whole field of sports television marketing, working for a team, a league, a players association, a, a college. Um, so I can interview someone like that and talk to him about how he got where he was in the world as well as getting his insights on the coming NFL season. So there'll be guests. It'll be players, coaches, commentators, uh, uh, GMs, administrators, uh, thought leaders uh, that I'll interview and then take calls uh, from people to understand what's on their minds and I think I'm a little bit helped in that I speak once a week around the country so you get the questions and 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 also I do talk radio as a guest so you get to understand what's on uh, people's minds and then I'm writing on these topics and you get feedback so you understand what's trending and, and what's hot. And so a combination of my opinions, guess, talk. Um, I probably won't sing. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't cause close a, the option there. I'd leave the option and, open. And cause a national panic. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but, I, but I think it would be a combination of that. We, we might do a debate on some hot topic uh, where we get strong opinions played out uh, both ways. And then at some point, talk about what agentry is and give people a sense of that uh, and, and a sense of uh, a curiosity. And then I may tell some stories and anecdotes and take people through some of the really interesting experiences uh, that I've had. What's the most misunderstood part of sports business? Uh, uh, you know, negotiating, uh, posturing, uh, I don't know. What, I mean, what, what do you find that people consistently don't get about what you do? See, I've always thought that traditional agentry was not done correctly because all it emphasizes is a player is an economic figure. And really the job is to look at a player holistically and to get into their heart and mind, to ask questions, to force them to prioritize their values, and then to build a lifelong plan, which is going to transcend the narrow sports career to help them into second career. So we have three players who are now minority owners of NFL teams. 
work done in Atlanta, for example, and to help them be role models to make, make sure that they're retracing their roots to the high school, collegiate, and professional community so that they set up a high school scholarship fund, they do what a Troy Aikman did at UCLA or Eric Harris or Edger and James at the University of Miami, which is to establish a college scholarship fund. And then at the pro level, Ward Dunn just put the 134th single mother and her family into the first home they'll ever own by making the down payment and having Home Depot outfitted. Um, so they can be role models. And part of your job as an agent is to be a steward of the sport. So it means no deleterious contract negotiations that put players in a bad light and push fans away. It means never encouraging a collective bargaining process that results in a strike. It's building the brand. So the point is to the extent that the public looks at agents as just skimming the cream from the top, not caring, that's a, a, a very negative, negative type of uh, imagery, and sometimes it's true. Hey, you mentioned uh, work done, and uh, you didn't mention uh, uh, Arthur Blank at, at, with the Atlanta Falcons, but indirectly, and you mentioned uh, Home Depot. Uh, work done, is he an unusual type of player uh, in, in his per perception on what he does and what he can do, or are there a lot more like him in the league? There are a lot more like him, and we profile, since I started with Steve Bartkowski back in 1975, I've profiled athletes to try to get players who will do those things. So it can be Warren Moon with his Crescent Moon Foundation, or Troy Aikman uh, with his foundation. Warren sends high school kids to college. Derek Thomas did literacy. Steve Young does youth uh, charities. Um, John Starks uh, retrofitted high schools in Tulsa. Here's the point. You take this massive group of athletes, coaches, and now we follow them around and we put a microscope on them. It's not news that our athletes have raised over $800 million for charity. Every aberration, every drunk driving, every domestic violence, is covered now and it gives you a distorted view of what an actual day in most athletes life is like and and you would get the sense that athletic behavior has somehow um, descended into new levels of misbehavior and it's really not true uh, but we have a celebrity driven press now one untoward incident is bad enough but honestly, um, I've gone some 40 years representing athletes who come to me making a pledge that they're going to make a difference and understand their power as role models. So you take domestic violence. Lennox Lewis cut a public service announcement, the heavyweight champ, that said, real men don't hit women. And that could do more to cure bad behavioral attitudes towards domestic violence in young people than a thousand authority figures ever could. And so you mentioned the players, uh, Warren Moon, and we talked about work done, and I was thinking about uh, a guy like Arthur Blank, who um, I got to know, I actually did his book when he was with the Home Depot, and a guy like here in uh, St. Pete, St. Petersburg, we've got uh, Stuart Stein Sternberg, who uh, owns the Tampa Bay Rays. These two guys seem quite unique in their sports. Uh, they're, they're community guys. They, they seem to have hearts. How much of it is having the right athlete, and how much of it is having the right partner on the other side uh, to do it, uh, the deal? Well, I think it's both, but, but you look at Bob Kraft in New England. Um, you look at the Roonies in uh, Pittsburgh. You can look around, and that's the power of sports, the imagery that's brought into people's living rooms. It's got this extraordinary power to, to impact the whole culture of a geographical area used for good. And 
The NFL right now is by two to one the most popular sport in this country. It is dominating American sports. And second is college football. So football alone can take an issue and dramatize it. And so there needs to be an understanding of that power. And when instead you get athletes who, uh, owners who don't care about that, or athletes who don't um, uh, understand that, it's a waste. Uh, I want to ask you a little bit about that kind of darker period of your career where things kind of fell apart. But I don't want to linger on, on the, the, the details so much because I know you've talked about that. What I am curious about is, um, in my own experience, I've worked with uh, some very high-profile corporate types who have fallen from grace uh, after writing their books. And uh, it's always kind of shocking how uh, people run from them, people who you know claim to be their friends or close associates at the first sign of trouble. They have, there's no faith in the relationship and the person. And I wondered if you experienced a lot of that in your own situation. See, the world didn't run away from me. I went away from the world. So I, <clears throat> when I was having problems with alcohol, except for like a drunk driving arrest, I was mostly isolating. I was by myself. Um, and then when I went into sober living in uh, March of 2010, I had withdrawn. So many of my friends didn't know where to find me. I put sobriety first, and then after that, being a good father. So it was not them withdrawing from me. It was me withdrawing uh, from them. So now over the last, I'm in my fifth year of sobriety, so over the last few years as I've reemerged, um, uh, all my friends have been very receptive and though my family and, and close friends were were more than kind and a number of people reached out to the extent that I was uh, public about it um, I mean I got calls from Charles Barkley from people all Earl Campbell people all over the world of sports and um, so I think I was treated uh, really well by people, um, and but it's a shattering experience for people around you who may have looked up or even put you on a pedestal, and where you played a central role in their life as the font of uh, wisdom and advice and and standards. Um, to see that happen. It's destabilizing to them. So it's on me to to show them behaviorally first that I'm not there and second of all to to make the amends and to repair the relations. You had this incredible rela uh, reputation uh, leading up to that point obviously where you know you're regarded as this, the number one agent in the country. You've got so many number one draft picks, all that kind of stuff. Um, going through that, I, I, I hate to. I, I don't want to seem like I'm trying to put a positive light on what was obviously a very difficult time. But does it humanize you to some of these clients and, and people who you work with now? Or they go, you know, because you seemed infallible to a certain point, and now it turns out, hey, even Lee Steinberg has issues. Oh, you know, I don't think I was arrogant through those years. No, no, I, 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 I didn't use that word. No, at all. Was, I wouldn't. I, wouldn't I use always that word. bifurcated um, uh, all of that. This has given me an opportunity, by being open and sharing, to to give some hope to people struggling with uh, substance abuse all across the country. So the American people, some of them luxuriate in the fall of the high and mighty, but they also love to see someone come back. So the key in all this is that, you know, I went on a book tour um, where it had 600 million uh, press and other things that happened and, and gave 60 speeches and went to 27 campuses and it was all um, fine and, and, and positive. And the projects are flooding in, we're going to recruit our first big crop of uh, football players and we have 
opportunity everywhere. I feel blessed because um, if I'm just sober and a good father, all the rest of it is is a blessing. And if I can just continue to help some people, um, either individually or with with some of the social programs that we do, I mean it's all uh, it's all good. So um, it. Um, <clears throat> And now I can be of service to people who are struggling um, in the same place I was uh, five years ago. All right. So I, I said I didn't want to linger too long on that. I think you handled that very well. Thank you for, for tackling it. Um, now we're heading into another football season without an NFL team in Los Angeles, of all places. Uh, in fact, uh, there are two NBA teams. Uh, the only football team being football being played there is the Arena Football League franchise owned by Gene Simmons and Paul Stanley of KISS. Uh, how weird is that, and how, how, how surprised are you that that still has not been resolved? Well, you might remember I was the chairman of Save the Rams and fought very hard to keep them here. When people would ask me, I'd say, if we lose the Rams, we may well lose the Raiders. And it'll be years before a team comes back. Well, we lost both teams. It's now been 20 years. The key to this is Los Angeles doesn't have the requisites that are necessary to bring a team back. First, a civic leader that you can coalesce around. Second, one venue that that is a stadium, a, the right place to play. Third. Uh, a little bit of, of uh, public money to just do a few improvements, not to build the stadium. Uh, fourth, some press support. Fifth, um, we have a whole generation now who's grown up never experiencing a local team. Now they have three games on TV. Um, you have Southern California, which has got so many other things to do on, on a Sunday. So the NFL... Well, and then the argument was, well, the NFL needs us because we've got 18 million people here. You know what? The TV contract's about quadrupled since we in the last 20 years and without L.A. So if a team comes here, it'll be magnificently supported. The entertainment industry, they will sell luxury boxes and great seats at premium prices. They'll have marketing that will be amazing. It will, it's only 10 concert dates. So the league has wanted to have a team here all through 2000. They offered us the franchise, couldn't deliver. Houston took it. Tagliabue wanted it at the end of his reign. They want it again now. The Raiders are making noises about coming. Um, but Los Angeles has got to step up. Uh, whether it's a mayor or the head of the board of supervisors, our best chance was AEG and Phil Anschutz, but then Todd Liawicki, who was really doing a good job of putting all the elements in place downtown, um, left, and now Anschutz wants a deal that's more than what the NFL wants to give him in terms of ownership, so we're stuck again. All right, and speaking of Los Angeles franchises, and you know I'm going to ask you about this, I'm kind of interested in your perspective, in brief, because I'm sure you've dealt with it, uh, but on uh, Donald Sterling and the Clippers. So I think there's a real opportunity now with uh, Steve Ballmer taking over because the Lakers are down uh, dramatically. <clears throat> They've owned this city forever, from Will Chamberlain, Elton Baylor, and Jerry West to... Showtime with Magic and Cream and James Worthy to uh, Shaq and Kobe. But they had an abysmal year last year. They don't look like they're going to do much better than 500 this year. And you have a very attractive team across the street with the Clippers that's got two worst city that love stars. And you got Blake Griffin, Chris Paul, a uh, telegenic uh, coach. And, and an owner that paid four times what the value I was. I think the word you're looking for is a shitload. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you think of the fact Forbes had the franchise valued at $550 million in January, yeah. 
and now six months later he pays two billion for it. So um, right now is a period where Steve Ballmer's got a honeymoon because it's like ding dong the witch is dead, and uh, so it's a happy time. And I think he's going to spend an amazing amount of money on promotion, amazing amount of money on anything that can now replace um, the domination that the Lakers have had forever. Um, the only problem the Clippers have is they're in a division that has Oklahoma City <laughs> and has San Antonio in it. And it may be a little while till they supplant those teams. And what about this? Um, how, how did uh, NBA Commissioner Adam Silver's handling, uh, well, basically his unforgiving handling of uh, Donald Sterling and the alleged, the alleged racism uh, compare with NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell's uh, white glove treatment of uh, Ray Rice and accusations of spousal abuse? Can, can you even discuss those in the same sentence? Adam Silver was brilliant. Um, the third rail of race was touched. However, that came to light may not have set a great precedent in terms of public private, but worldwide there was a wave that threatened to really threatened all of the revenue sources player relations, every aspect of the NBA. And this poor commissioner had been on the job a couple months. He acted decisively, due process, diffused the situation, was very astute in the way he worked with the other owners, worked with the players association, let the process work it out with Shelby uh, Sterling and um, the public perception uh -huh. of domestic violence being treated more leniently than possession of marijuana is not a good one. Now, the players collectively bargained the substance abuse penalties. So behind the scenes, they they agreed to those penalties. If you miss, if you first offense, second offense, third offense. Uh -huh. But societally, you've got states that um, where marijuana is legal, and domestic violence is a terrible thing. And Ray Rice's first press conference was not taking a whole lot of responsibility. First and second of all. He used some words of violence. Um, so I don't think the commissioner looked or came off for a wall in, in that situation. Uh, the commissioner of the NFL, Roger Goodell, came off wall in that. All right, I've got one more topic I want to ask you about. We've talked about NBA, uh, NFL. We touched on arena football even. Uh, I want to ask you about baseball, and I want to bring this home to my market uh, I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida. We've got the Tampa Bay Rays here. And they, I hate to say it because I love the team and I'm very, I'm very respectful of the people who run the franchise, but they literally crushed the spirit of fans a few weeks ago. And I suspect even their manager, Joe Madden, uh, and the players by trading away David Price, uh, Cy Young winner, having possibly the best season of his career this year, leading the league in strikeouts, all that kind of stuff. Um, every year, something like this happens in a small market to a small market team. These franchises cannot hold on to high priced talent long if they are not in a pennant hunt. They can't tie they can't tie themselves over to the next year for somebody with a ten, twelve, fifteen million dollar contract. Um, from a perspective of an agent, is there something wrong with this picture or is it just economics and that's just the way it's gonna be? Well you'd have to explain <clears throat> why the best record in baseball is held by the Oakland A's. They have the same constraints. They operate with like the fourth lowest payroll. And they have half they a dozen have, former Tampa Bay Rays players. <laughs> and, and they do the best. So, so organization and team chemistry counts a lot. Mm -hmm. 
In other words, the Yankees aren't winning the World Series every year. The Dodgers aren't winning the World Series every year. I did an article a couple of years ago that showed that more mid-range teams were were winning in a lot of situations. Um, the truth of the matter is Tampa Bay has a manager that's worth a number of players because he's so good. And um, uh, the rea- reality of the situation is that in general, it's it's ownership, it's structure, it's it's a concept of how to win, it's an astute look at saber metrics, it's it's team chemistry that will win, because a lot of that money is spent um, on the past of star free agents, not their future. So if you look at the Angels here in Southern California. They spent a fortune on Albert Pujols, but they spent it on his past performance, not his future performance. So many of those high payroll teams are loaded up with players past their prime. And um, and it's younger players in their prime that are, you know, critical in the key and the key, which you can hold on to for a while. Um, I scratch my head at David Price because Who's to say with half the season to go that Tampa wouldn't come back? Right. And they've been a great second half team. So, um, uh, and who's to say that they couldn't afford him? You know, at at the end, they at least should you know have given it a, a, a chance. And let me tell you something else. When I have a player in free agency, I sit him down and I say, let's look at short term economic gain long-term economic security, family considerations, geographical location, um, weather, lifestyle, climate. Um, And now let's look at endorsements. Let's look at uh, being on a winning team, um, the the quality of the the managing or coaching. So um, uh, your teammates, the facilities, Not all players want to go to New York or Los Angeles if you really understand athletes. So many, many times it's a combination of of other qualities. The number of players who actually make a decision precisely on that this team pays them five million more dollars is not as high as you'd think. Uh, If I took you through that free agency process, it tends to be a combination of a lot of different things and winning you know is is right there and for a lot of them it's geographical location also because it's such a long season you know it's not like football where you're going to be somewhere from uh, august to december and then have seven months off well uh lee i I suspect uh we could uh, keep talking forever I know I'd have a million other questions. It occurred to me I'm wearing my Florida State hat. I should ask you about that, but I'm not going to – yeah, yeah. <laughs> good enough. I think we'll let it go with that. Um, folks, listen, uh, starting August 18th, you can hear the Lee Steinberg Show every Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific on Yahoo Sports Radio. And you can find uh, Lee Steinberg's latest book, The Agent. Uh, my 40-year career making deals and changing the game, written with Michael Arkush, uh, or his previous book, for that matter, uh, Winning with Integrity, Getting What You're Worth Without Selling Your Soul, uh, anywhere books are sold, or you can order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. Uh, Lee, is there a uh, particular website you want people to come find you at? It's um, www.steinbergsports.com. And are you on uh, Twitter? I know you're on Facebook because uh, that's where at I'm Lee at. Steinberg. Okay, very good. Uh, Lee, uh, good luck with the new radio show, and uh, Thank you. I hope the book is doing well. And uh, look forward to talking in 2034 and again in 2054. Thank you so there much. There you go. Thank you. All right, be well. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh, Lee, just say your name for a minute, and let's... Uh, Lee Steinberg. All right. Do you have some ID? 
Um, Just kidding. <laughs> on. By the way, I'm wearing my Florida State hat. I never wear hats for the show, but I figure, you know, conversation about sports, I can get away with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The preceding presentation was brought to you by The Realm Network.